Come back with me. Where? Back to the future. I've made hundreds of YouTube videos at this point, maybe close to thousands. And in all that time, I have never talked about Back to the Future, which is one of my favorite movies. And also one of the greatest movies ever made. Maybe, maybe the best movie ever made. But did you know there may be a little known 1950s comic that inspired Back to the Future? And I don't think anyone's ever talked about this. Are these the secret origins of Back to the Future that no one's ever revealed but me? Great Scots! When this baby hits 88 miles per hour, you're gonna see some serious shit. Back to the Future is the perfect mixed genre masterpiece, combining comedy, science fiction, drama, suspense, and even romance. One of the elements that makes it such a great story is its combination of a high stakes premise with a hilarious twist. Imagine the horror of going back in time and accidentally, seemingly bumbling your way into undoing your very existence by causing your parents to never get together in the first place. And while this is the ultimate dilemma, it's also incredibly funny. Now you have the impossible task of having to get your parents to hook back up again. And to make matters worse, it turns out that your father is just this terrible, terrible dork, just the, the biggest geek imaginable. And then your mom is kind of the school slut who's in love with you. At least that was the initial premise by Bob Gale. What a scenario, what a scenario. Back to the Future has been called the perfect screenplay and watching it again last night after almost 10 years, I'm reminded of just how amazing it is. Every scene builds on the next, creating a concophony of story momentum. But how did such a great story come to be? How did the storytellers of Back to the Future achieve such perfection? Of course, credit goes to the brilliant script by Bob Gale, Robert Zemeckis' amazing direction, the iconic design of the DeLorean, Huey Lewis's soundtrack, The Power of Love, and Alan Silvestri's unforgettable score. This is a movie that is inspired. It is divinely inspired. And I believe that Robert Zemeckis owes some of that inspiration to his childhood influence of reading 1950s EC Comics. EC Comics were known for their mix of horror, science fiction, dark humor, and mixed genre tales, just like Back to the Future. Zemeckis, who grew up in the 1950s reading EC Comics, has mentioned their influence on his storytelling style several times. One comic in particular that stands out is The Man Who Was Killed in Time, which deals with a man traveling back in time and getting stuck in a time loop, causing his own death repeatedly. While this is not directly similar to Back to the Future's story, it does feature a visual motif of the key event that causes the time travel shenanigans, that being a car accident, much like how Marty McFly is hit by a car triggering his own time travel paradox. Stella! Another one of these damn kids jumped in front of my car! What's charming about this story is the illustration at the end that explains how time travel could cause a paradox. We may take ideas like this for granted, but it shows how in the 1950s, the concept of time travel was still new and weird to many readers as EC Comics innovated time travel stories in the medium. A Sound of Thunder, the famous Ray Bradbury short story was adapted for the first time in a visual medium as an EC comic. In this story, a time traveler accidentally steps on a butterfly in the prehistoric past causing the butterfly effect, where small changes in the past lead to significant changes in the future. There are many other time travel stories in EC Comics that Zemeckis and Gale likely read, including The Time Machine and The Schmo, Time to Leave, Time for a Change, Made of the Future, The Man Who Raced Time, Saving for the Future, The Tenth at Noon, Why Papa Left Home, and Given the Air, among many more. Having read myself EC Comics over the last 12 to 15 years, I can definitely attest to the greatness of some of their stories. They have influenced me in a way that uh, has helped me in my own storytelling. From reading them, I've learned about the simplicity and efficiency of their storytelling, the memorable moments, and the power of a great hook, and especially the twist endings. I mean, they deliver a story sensation that I have to say is directly similar to the works of Robert Zemeckis. Great Scott! Great Scott! Great Scott! Great Scott! Oh, great Scott! Anyone who's read an EC comic is very familiar with the expression, good lord, 
which is stated by some character in a state of shock in nearly every EC story. And I believe that the expression by Doc Brown, Great Scots, was a tribute to Good Lord from EC Comics. Great Scott! Great Scott! Great Scott! While there's no direct quote from Zemeckis linking back to the future to EC Comics, his love for them is well documented. The film's tone blending humor, adventure, and sci-fi feels like an EC comic come to life. Zemeckis and Gale's appreciation for comic books from their childhood clearly influenced their creative process. Bob Gale himself has credited comic books as a significant influence on his creativity and storytelling approach. In various interviews, he has mentioned that reading comics as a child helped shape his understanding of narrative structure, character development, and visual storytelling. Gale specifically admired EC Comics for their blend of horror, science fiction, and dark humor, which left a lasting impression on him. He noted, Comic books were a huge part of my childhood. They taught me how to tell a story visually and how to keep readers engaged with dynamic characters and surprising plot twists. We were definitely influenced by the kinds of stories we grew up reading. Comics, especially like the more daring ones at EC, showed us that you could blend genres and still tell a coherent, exciting story. The Weird Science Tale, Given the Air, is a classic example of the grandfather paradox. Here, a man sends a time traveler back in time to kill an 1880s oil baron in order to ensure that one of his great-grandparents gains the inheritance which would be passed down to him. The plan to make him and his wife rich works, except when he learns that his wife's ancestors were related to the oil baron the entire time. In the final panel, his wife poofs out of existence similar to how characters in Back to the Future fade out of existence when a grandfather paradox is triggered. In one of the deleted scenes from Back to the Future Part 2, you can more clearly see Biff fade out of existence in a very similar scenario where he gives his past self the sports almanac so that he can become rich and powerful in the 1985 timeline, supposedly the Back to the Future comic book Biff to the Future, which was written by Bob Gale, explains the detail of why Biff faded out of existence because when he altered the past to ensure his fortune, it ended up that Lorraine McFly, Marty's mother, shot Biff Tannen in an act of self-defense during a confrontation where Biff went too far therefore resulting in a grandfather paradox where his 80-year-old self poofed out of existence in 2015. What did I tell you? 88 miles per hour! I feel like you can tell in the way that Zemeckis frames his shots, in the way that he composes his scenes, in the way that his story has such good momentum, and in the way that his characters interact with each other with their larger-than-life demeanors. This is directly the way that I feel reading certain EC comics. I think that of all the filmmakers from that generation, Zemeckis is the one that really captures the essence of EC stories. Robert Zemeckis' love for EC Comics did not end with Back to the Future. He also co-created the Tales from the Crypt TV series, which was my probably favorite TV series growing up in the late 80s and early 90s. He even directed the pilot episode and helped to produce the series seven seasons. Death Becomes Her is another film that I feel like is an EC comic come to life with its dark humor and supernatural elements. Supposedly, it was originally intended to be a Tales from the Crypt movie, but then at some point it spinned off into its own thing. But Death Becomes Her is one of my favorite films of all time, along with Back to the Future. That ain't no airplane! Look! While Zemeckis hasn't explicitly stated that Back to the Future or Death Becomes Her was inspired by EC Comics, the influence is clear. The film's playful, adventurous spirit, combined with its ethical dilemmas and time travel themes, echoes the storytelling style of EC Comics. It's also worth noting that Robert Zemeckis was not the only filmmaker inspired by EC Comics. Steven Spielberg, George Lucas, James Cameron, Peter Jackson, George Romero, and novelist Stephen King have all cited growing up reading EC Comics as kids. And I think that really says something about the quality of these stories in that the greatest generation of filmmakers ever to live 
grew up reading these comics. Back in the 1950s, you didn't have the plethora of entertainment stuff that we have today. And you didn't have all these TV shows and movies dealing with science fiction and fantasy. The best way to get that genre back then was through comic books. In fact, comic books in the 1950s were bigger than TV and movies at that time. That was when comic books were in their heyday, and, and that was when these science fiction and fantasy and horror stories and romance were reaching that greatest generation of filmmakers. One of my favorite and funniest EC time travel tales is Why Papa Left Home. In this story, a scientist is supposed to be sent back in time 25 years for a two-hour trip, then return home safely. Something goes wrong when his partner operating the machine dies, and he is accidentally sent back two years instead of two hours. During his two-year stay, he believes he's stuck in the past forever. He meets a beautiful woman and falls in love. Soon after, they get married and have a baby. When the two years passes, he is suddenly shot back into the future, where he discovers to his horror that the woman he fell in love with in the past was a younger version of his own mother, and he has inadvertently become his very own father. Aspects of this story are not unsimilar to how Marty's mother falls in love with him in Back to the Future, except luckily in the film, Marty recognizes his own mother and avoids sleeping with her. You know, Back to the Future is one of those movies that is so good that I don't even like to watch it too often. In fact, I haven't seen it in about 10 years. And it recently hit Netflix again, and I realized, all right, it's time to watch Back to the Future again. And you'd think that if Back to the Future is possibly my favorite movie that I would watch it more often. But it's so good that I don't like to watch it too frequently because... I want to give my brain a little bit of time to forget the movie, to forget the premise, so that I can be surprised again, so that the key moments in the movie can impact me in a way that I wasn't expecting. It's been said about a great story that one of the worst things is that you cannot experience it again for the first time, so I try to preserve the experience of watching the film again. Anyway, last night on Netflix, Back to the Future came out, so I was like, it's time to watch it again. Watching it again this time, there were some key moments that really had an impact on me. That moment where Marty gets on a skateboard and he's being chased by the gang through the downtown streets, and then he's about to be pushed into the manure cart and he lets the skateboard go under the car and jumps over it. That was just, it's so well done. So well done. It really gives you a rush. And I think that it has the best ending of all time. I mean, the most satisfying ending imaginable. I think that Back to the Future is an eternal movie. I think that, like time itself, people will be watching this movie far into the future. 200, 500 years into the future. Uh, they'll be looking back on this in the way that we sort of look back at Renaissance art. Again, this is not a video gushing over Back to the Future and every little moment and how good it was, but this is definitely a script and a story that were just so well executed on every level. So the next time you watch Back to the Future, which is on Netflix now, Consider the original inspiration for how good of a story that was. The fact that Bob Gale and Zemeckis were inspired by the comics they read as a kid is really charming, and it shows how much the stuff that we love growing up as a kid, like Back to the Future and Death Becomes Her and Tales from the Crypt, can inspire a future generation of storytellers. Of course, EC Comics are infamous for being banned comic books from the 1950s. In fact, most people don't know this still, but there was a congressional hearing in the 1950s to decide if comic books were the cause of juvenile delinquency. That's right, people at the time literally thought comic books were ruining society, and you thought that people were crazy today. Well, while the medium itself wasn't completely censored, essentially EC as a comic book publisher went out of business. They started publishing magazines instead, and what's interesting and what made me want to make this video now is because after 70 years, EC Comics are coming back. That's right, they're going to start printing them again. Of course, they won't be written by Gaines and Feldstein again. There'll be a, a whole new bunch of writers, and I'm a little bit nervous to see how these new writers are going to be able to handle this sort of material. Are they even going to try to compete with the EC style, which some people called it formulaic, but I think that it was an amazing style and it led to some really interesting stories within those limitations of only about four or five pages. I'm eager to check out these new stories from EC and see what's going on there. 
Even if they're not that good, even if they don't live up to the story sensation I got from reading the original EC comics, I still think it's a good thing that they're coming out with new stories again because it's going to lead to new readers discovering the EC comics from the 50s, just like I did about 15 years ago. So that's good. Also, check out my series, Robots Bedtime Stories, which is a dramatic reading of some of my favorite EC comics and other 1950s comics. It's a series I'll be restarting soon with a new episode, coming later this year probably. Make sure to subscribe and like, blah blah blah. Well, that's it for today. Thanks for watching. I've been Tyson XIX, and join me next time for another video investigating comic books and movies. Till then, I'll see you next time.